Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for joining us for the very first of our Spain 2020 Pale Research Seminar Series. Today we have Heroes Gyalso, she is a candidate, a doctor, and an all about dissertation. Who has been working on the uh, issue of emergent perception, complicated system. Particularly, both agent report on learning. Uh, the work that Nancy is going to present today is AMS 2023, and she is traveling to London and met us at uh, the premier of agents for first. And the paper is titled A Theory of Mind Approach and Self Identification. Um, just to do a quick check, I hope that the screen is shared. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear us. If you can't, I don't know how you would be able to tell me. But with that, and without further ado, please welcome Nancy. Hi everyone, I'm Nancy and I'll be giving a talk, a uh, seminar talk about the paper that was recently accepted at AMS. Um, and I think I have, there's a lot of concepts in here that might be really interesting to talk about. So, okay. so the outline of this talk is going to be, we're gonna talk about the basic concepts of what multi-agent systems are, what is multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, what are cooperative um, multi-agent reinforcement learning uh, and what are non-cooperative agents. Then we'll move into the topic of adversarial communication. What is emergent learning behaviors in adversarial communication in, in learning settings, specifically adversarial communication. Adversarial attacks are under this kind of area topic for just general adversarial communication, but not necessarily for emergent, but it can appear to be that way. Um, and then we'll talk about defenses against adversarial communication. Then we'll move over into the concepts of what theory of mind is about, the psychology of, um, of theory of mind, how it translates and how people interpret theory of mind when it comes to some sort of mathematical model, the usages of theory of mind and the associated costs with theory of mind when implemented onto a system. And then we'll finally get to our test time mitigation against emergent adversarial communication using TOM as a mechanism constructor design um, which is also based on something which is uh, found in game theory, which is about signaling games. And then we'll have some an environment and empirical results of how this defense works um, in test time. <clears throat> so multi-agent system is a really general uh, definition. It just implies that we have a set of N agents which interact with a shared environment. Specifically, um, Multi-agent settings, right, has, we usually, in single settings, right, um, when we learn, when we talk about a learning framework, we talk about single agent reinforce, reinforcement learning, which is called RL. In multi-agent learning settings, we translate some of a lot of the methods from single RL to multi-agent RL. And the old difference is, is that in a single setting, right, we usually have one agent with the environment um, when he interacts with the environment. And then likewise, when multi-agents, they could have many agents take it at the same time. They could have it in uh, discrete non-synchronous time. There's a lot of different methods when it comes to multi-agent settings. So traditionally, we just say for a multi-agent reinforcement learning, um, it's basically a tuple, meaning it's just a collection of things. So a number of agents, the set of actions for each agent, the probability transition uh, matrix, uh, the reward function, and then we have the set. So normally we have in regular reinforcement learning with the common states, we have states. Here we have observations, mainly because a lot of um, multi-agent reinforcement learning schematics use POMDPs, which are partially observable uh, local observations of the environment instead of explicitly the state. So then those observations put together, quote, make the system. This is the specific <clears throat> Q value approach, uh, Q value um, for multi agent reinforcement learning under uh, complete full observability. So, when this is broken, of course, this actually doesn't really hold, but this works when, like, the 
partial observabil uh, observ observability of other agents together completes the state. So moving from multi-agent reinforcement learning, we're going to look specifically at a subset of it called cooperative uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning. Primarily cooperative settings imply that we have agents who have a common goal or they share rewards. So more cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning called COMAR or sometimes called CMAR. Um, there are a lot of methods that are implied explicitly for this. So for example, independent learners are uh, very much similar to single agent reinforcement learning, but a whole bunch of agents in an environment. Fully observable critic is like the one you saw before, where partially observable observations of agents are put together in some sort of way to make a, full, a more fully observable critic. The value function factorization is the idea that jobs of agents themselves like can be decomposable and that a team objective can be decomposed into individual jobs. Um, so the idea is that we don't actually have to expend super expensive training for training for a particular environment for a set of agents. Rather, we can reduce it down to a set of unique agents and then deploy that across. Uh, there's consensus and learning to communicate, which is primarily to work with transmitting information across agents to help coordinate and incorporate uh, uh, coordinate actions among agents. <laughs> so communication is primarily what we'll be talking about. Um, it is a, uh, an important construct to Comar, um, and it, it usually is there, right, um, in the sense that uh, when we have environments which each agent is, um, is, um, is, has partial observability, right, so it, they are unable to actually observe the entire full state, right, communicate can, communicating can uh, transmit that information across agents and help agents along. <clears throat> so for adversarial communications, right, so co-moral settings produce corporate policies that optimize their team performance. However, um, emergent adversarial communication from non cooperative learning agents in an environment can learn um, adversarial policies, which would harm a corporate team's performance, as in like uh, adversarial communication messages. So adversarial machine learning attacks for corporate settings and co-moral primarily, uh, these are the literatures uh, that are listed at this current moment in time that kind of list themselves underneath corporate or co-moral settings for regular machine learning attacks, adversarial machine learning attacks. We have adversarial uh, attacks in consensus-based moral. We have adversarial attacks on cooperative AI, so that's more general than just reinforcement learning, of course. On the robustness of cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning, adversarial attacks for a corp uh, cooperative moral using learned dynamics models. So basically, adversarial attacks tend to be one particular type of approach for uh, adversarial communications. And they can merge in learning settings as well. Adversarial, and then specifically, uh, or more generally for uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning, so not necessarily just co-moral, but what environments that are shared, we have basically uh, a whole bunch of different types of attacks that specify on top of the components of the multi-agent agent, like the multi-agent. So the action space, the observation space, communication profiles, uh, even the environment dynamics are those kind of uh, surface areas of which there are attacked using adversarial machine learning. So cooperative agents often overly rely and trust information from communication channels because there's limited exposure to adversarial communications during training, uh, right? So if you're training in a setting for a cooperative task, you're not really in trying to learn like uh, uh, a variety of distributions which represent adversarial behavior. You're just working with cooperative agents and they learn together. So for defenses against adversarial communication, there are two defenses that are primarily out. One of them was more recent and one of them was used for the paper explicitly. So message filtering is the concept that where if you have a communication message that's being transmitted to another agent or to a set of agents, right? You can filter through that information and, uh, and determine how much weighting of that particular weight of that message do you want to incorporate into your decision-making for a model. So that's the variation autoencoder based um, method that was proposed. And then there's something called the ablate message ensemble, which was from a previous, uh, more recent paper, which was primarily working on not too different in terms of encoding uh, schematics, but um, it was a little bit beyond the scope of this paper because this was later on. So for the first one, for the vari uh, variation autoencoder base, right, the idea comes that weighing information based on location distribution can have some sort of uh, filtering mechanism or parity that you can apply onto data to filter out 
um, basically obvious deceptive uh, data or adversarial data. So does this message distribution match a learned corporate distribution? So specifically for the VAEB, they train this model, their general model on corporate data that was um, that was queried to the set of agents, right? So they learn the corporate distribution that's sitting in the model for uh, fixed parameters, and they use that on top, like a layer on top. So it requires training a defense model and a retraining of the defense every time the underlying um, learned policy of these agents are changed. So if you say train your agents one day, you train the VAB. If you end up retraining the agents for some other reason, right, you'll have to retrain your VAB. So moving on to theory of mind. So theory of mind, before we get into this, right, is the is that it first originated from a paper that was about chimpanzees and whether or not chimpanzees have a theory of mind and they can associate concepts of other people's desires, intent, and so forth, right? So the idea of theory of mind is that you're assigning mental states to others. Like that's actually used as a factor in part of your decision-making. And most theory of mind models kind of are modeled after Bayesian reasoning and they use some sort of order of k order reasoning. So recursive beliefs. What I think you sh what I think you know, what you think I know, so forth. So Tom can be leveraged by Comal to promote coordination, cooperation, and collaboration. So there are works on Tom that are primarily used for the benefit of cooperative cooperation um, settings, often demonstrated through games like Hanabi. So Hanabi is a game uh, where it is a fully cooperative game where you need to coordinate people's actions and cards together. But you can't, but you don't know the actual face of your cards themselves. So in some ways, right, you have to signal by your decisions alone, like wh whether or not you decide um, to uh, put down a card or not, um, to signal to other people whether or not uh, to maximize the the goal of Hanabi. So primary, um, um, the primary methods of Tom is probabilistic recursive reasoning and generalized recursive reasoning. So those are really just the models for Bayesian reasoning, k-order reasoning. So, however, Tom, right, as just a construct and a thing that can enable more complex behaviors, can be learned, can be used to uh, learn also deceptive behaviors. So in this particular paper here, they teach. Uh, um, learning agents how to create more deceptive strategies in a game that's very similar to a game called Among Us, um, where they learn specifically more complicated behaviors that we would consider deceptive rather than the baseline of learning without a TLM. So Tom can be used for a lot of things, right? So the idea here is we want to use Tom as a defense, as, as a construct for a defense um, against adversarial communication, right? However, right, you can get the idea that learning Tom directly, right, uh, is a very expensive process, right? Recursively thinking about what other people think and then what they think about you is a very expensive thing to do. Primarily, it sits in train, it's a training time um, construct because of how you need to actually rest these values. Um, so, right, you need to, so you need to actually use, um, you need a lot of training data in order to uh, estimate these kind of thoughts. However, we can still construct mechanisms using for test time using uh, theory of mind um, to help us with live test time defenses, right? So things that we can't really more or less prepare for in training settings, but things that have to be done on live at, at test time. So finally, we're gonna get to a test time mitigation against emergent adversary communications. So, uh, to get you started off with this concept, right, before we get into what, uh, how TOM applies directly, right, I'm going to introduce to you something from game theory called signaling game. So a signaling game is a sequential game where you have two players, you have a set of games, and then you have a set of actions for each player, and they're identical across all games. So there's no way you can distinguish them differently that way. And then each game has their own payoffs. So forever uh, strategy profile, so pairing of actions between you, player one, player two, you determines your payoffs. So the rules of it is that both players know that there is some nature or distribution of the initial game. So like this is like the, the player na uh, nature, which is known in this, and it pulls a game from this distribution. Player one doesn't know, uh, player two doesn't know exactly which game it is. They just know the distribution. 
However, player one does know what game it is, and so they make the first move. So the idea is that player two, while they may not know exactly what game they are in, right, they can observe player one's actions, and that will be used as some sort of way to influence their decision making to select the best outcome. So in other words, right, information can be deduced from other rational agents' actions. This is very much aligned with the concepts of theory, uh, theory of mind, or if it's implying formulations, k-order curse of reason. So to set the stage of how we're going to use Tom for the um, test time, uh, let's start with some assumptions. So let's assume for a cooperative agent, so this is specifically um, for the settings where agents share the same policy are homogeneous, right? So Tom says, does the actions of another agent match my expectations of their actions under cooperative settings? So assuming that we actually all share the same brain, right? If we are given the same message, then we should expect the same behavior out of it or same distribution out of it. In communication settings, we consider chief talk messages. So primarily a lot of uh, learning frameworks when they introduce communication, they don't assign cost to communication. They're chief talk, meaning they can freely exchange information. There's no association of cost to it. And that's why they're trying to encourage communication across it. So a message M at a one time step before T, um, that matches an action at A of T. So in other words, you observe an action that occurred. Um, you observe, let's say you got a message from a previous time step. Then at the next time step, they actually perform the action. You get to observe whether or not their action is consistent with their message. So, uh, the, yeah. So in other words, you evaluate their message. So, and this can be done, right, in parallel with their actual decision-making while they're actually making decision-making. Because you can, you can, recall information and make prior uh, previous judgments upon their past actions while you're doing it. So it doesn't always have to be for the action right now. It could be like for all past actions. So Tom asks, right, does the transmitted observations of another agent match what actions I would before perform giving their message? Right, so this is under the whole assumption that we have the same policy. If it's not, wait, we would need access to their policy or some accepted public access policy uh, that we assume they're running by. And then agents with little consistency between messages and actions may not necessarily be adversarial. Like we don't actually know whether or not if their action message aligning, alignment, that, that means they're actually adversarial. However, should we consider their messages as our, as our input if they're not following their own messages? So we may not be able to distinguish if they're just solely adversarial, but we may be able to catch a bunch of a proportion of the population of adversarials in there. So primarily belief models, because we are using a belief model, right, is the belief of a trajectory given all your past action history. So this is something we call the AOH, is the action observation history up until the time step uh, prior, right? And so you can kind of uh, think of this as it's a conditional probability model. Uh, standard methods of training the belief model are done during training where there's sufficient samples. So uh, the training of this model specifically is done during training time. We do not necessarily have labels for adversarial behavior, right? Because in test settings, right, we, we only trained with corporate agents. We don't really know what adversarial behavior looks like. All we can know is whether or not their actions match their behavior in test time. Then we solely uh, propose a converge. So therefore, let's take this concept, right? We don't need all of it because that's a lot more information that we actually need. Let's consider a belief model where we have some belief over what the corporative, uh, the corporativeness or the uh, non-corporativeness of an agent, given its consistency history of actions and messages. So, will we update the uh, the belief over an agent's nature to be corporative or non-corporative, given our observations of their action observation message consistency against our own beliefs that are homogeneous polystyle? Uh, likewise, as I said before, um, this is a very good model, but it's extremely expensive to train. And it also is, it does a lot more than what we need. So for a test time in, uh, implementation of a defense, right, uh, given only the resources that we have, we need to minimize in some way some of the costs that are associated with this. So although it would be nice to have this stuff, we don't necessarily need it. So we just need only some basic concepts from belief. So it may suffice from under homogeneous settings for lower dimensional belief that consistency may be a good method of, of a test time defense. So theory of mind uh, against communications. This is the first part of the algorithm. This is a consistency uh, count algorithm. 
all it does is that each time that each cooperative agent has basically the previous message sent from every other agent, right? And then they will observe the actions of all other agents at the future time step. And then they will determine, evaluate underneath their own policy, whether or not that's the action they would have taken, right? So that's and, and or the valuation estimation. So primarily the action taken is used for deterministic policies. So if you set the policy to be deterministic, right? The action must match. If the policy underneath tends to be stochastic at some distribution, right? then we may need to look at the value estimation and compare whether or not how much difference of the optimal action would we be allowing uh, to be considered consistent. So if the distance between the, the values of the actions is greater than some threshold, right? If it's greater than what we will uh, use as a risk factor, right? Then we would increase inconsistency count and else increase the consistency action count. So in other words, literally just saying, if the action is within some value, distance of our optimal action, right? Maybe we'll take the, the well, maybe we'll consider them to be consistent. Whereas if they are full, uh, their action value, the worth of their action is a whole lot less than what our action is, right? Then maybe we would consider them to be inconsistent. This is the second part of the algorithm. So this is the actual belief update where we say, okay, at each time step, each corporate agent belief starts at some initial distribution. The initial distribution here just happens to be one because we're assuming belief trust across all agents in the beginning settings. Alternatively, you could have set it to zero just to see whether or not they would uh, be a slightly different behavior. But for, for all intended purposes, we set it to one because we want to trust other agents inputs initially because it, it, in the beginning of a particular, let's say settings like this, right? Uh, the most uncertainty tends to be from the beginning. So maybe there's a benefit to having it set to 1.0 like to one or a higher belief of trusting in the beginning. And then over time, it will adjust. So at each time step, the, the belief gets updated in the direction of the consistent or the inconsistent uh, observation. So if the action is consistent, right? That means, quote, we should increase our trust belief about this agent. And if it's inconsistent, we should decrease the trust of, of this agent. But also besides direction, we also include magnitude so this includes like a learning rate step as well as a ratio of the current consistency for an agent or inconsistency for an agent. So in other words, right, if an agent with high consistency of action uh, messages, right, singular instances like one or two sparing time steps, which are inconsistent, does not impact the trust belief much. Um, and likewise, agents with high inconsistency, right, singular instances of consistency does not impact the trust belief that much. So you might be very skeptical of, of another agent, right? What happens if let's say consistent for one or two time steps in the future, right? Then the magnitude of you adjusting your belief should be a whole lot less than if it's and then it's vice versa, right? So that's where that kind of comes from. So the ratio is based on the consistency count over time steps so far. So moving an agent from high consistency to low consistency requires more frequent and consistent actions as well as consistent actions, right? So, so this is the experiment setup. I just have this little GIF here to show you the idea of what the environment looks like in over time steps. So the task is to maximize the coverage of a 2D uh, grid map. You have basically two teams. You have like the corporate team and then you have like, you know, self-interested agents. So you can send them the other team. The actions are basically move up, down, left, right, no movement. And then all actions under this particular setting are joint actions, meaning they're all taken at the same time and uh, discrete time actions. The observations for each agent is going to be the local radius of the agent. Um, the reward is plus one for every white square that becomes one color, right? Um, and then agents, Primarily, they're cooperatives, so because this is a cooperative settings, and they follow something called the centralized training, decentralized execution, which means that in order to make training more efficient, right, we're using the same architecture for all these agents. So this, the uh, the policy that's running this uh, agent, this agent, and this agent are all the same policy, but they see different observations. And then we have the task. So one of the most important things about the CTDE. As specifically for this task is that the pursuit of local rewards for one agent, like the greedy local rewards for one agent, um, is representative of the maximization of the team reward. Not in all settings, that's not necessarily true, right? Because the maximization of local greedy rewards could result not in the maximization of team rewards, but this is the specific setting for this. 
and then messages. So messages are learned encoded representations of the local observation. So the radius, right, is learned, uh, is passed through like some like a, a convolution neural network, and it's some represented encoded latent space, which is shared across all agents. So all agents are transmit, they transmit their messages, which are aggregated together by an aggregated neural network in AGNN, which outputs, which the explicit output is a joint action. So an action for each agent, and then each agent gets that action and they perform it. So the learning method is as follows. It uses an after critic uh, architecture. It is a learning method that uses an after policy that selects actions and a critic which regresses the values of actions. The initial training settings is for five cooperative agents, six million time steps. Um, the self-interest agent, in other words, uh, the one agent that has a non-cooperative agent, which is later on, so you could be cooperative to six million time steps, six cooperative to And then the adaptive training is more than two years. Cooperative teams be able to relearn their policy again using a fixed self-interested agent. We lowered it to three so that we can have more space for these agents to conquer in terms of women. Uh, and we had one non-cooperative agent. So this is the uh, this is the empirical results for this before and after redaction training. So before the redaction training, so this is the ideal setting for the AD. After, right, let's say, okay, now the corporate policy is relearned, it's retrained, meaning it's training over with, let's say, some self-interested agents, right? Um, what happens to the performance of the VAD? Because it's no longer the same corporate distribution it learned, right? It falls out of distribution. There's a distribution drift, and therefore the performance of the VAD deteriorates because it's not, uh, the accuracy of it, it's not that great, right? However, if you look at the TOM, uh, TOM performance rate, it does about the same as before. Right, because we're using a different set of distributions than specifically the cooperative uh, learned representation. So the idea of our defense, right, is that we really want it to preserve its performance across any iterations of retraining, um, as well as not interfere with other defenses that are used. So here's the false positive, false negative F1 scores of it. So you can see over here that the VAB, um, the readaption training where you have a mean count um, around here. So false negatives meaning trusted adversary means that for the VAB, um, the way that it was working with is that I had to throw everybody to be um, it was just successful of every. So that's why you have very low trusted adversary because it's trusted adversary. In our particular defense, like there's still going to be a false positive count that results in it. The false positive here is that, okay, so this trusted corporate, because the baby distrusted everybody, that means they very much distrusted everything new from corporate evasion, right? But our BAV is, is a bit less in terms of that, um, because some of the behaviors that they encounter and between the differences, right, they deserve anything out of and then we have the true positive quarter detention, uh, detection uh, mean count. So in other words, right, how many uh, uh, corporate detections, uh, corporate agents did they accept? Um, messages obviously zero because they just trusted everybody. And then ours is, uh, you know, it's 200 out of like 300 and something time steps. Or uh, over, uh, yeah, 300 something time steps. And then we have the true positive area for adversary detection. So basically it's very similar here. Our Tom is very similar to VAEV because obviously they distrusted everybody. So, of course, they're going to get edited. And then this is the F1 scores. You can kind of see that Tom is a little bit better at um, uh, readaption training than VAE. So, the conclusions thoughts here is that theory in mind, while primarily viewed through recursive reasoning and requires it's usually used in training settings. It can be a mechanism design, like explicitly the way we design the defense, right? Um, under certain settings, such as homogeneous or cooperative settings. 
introducing mechanisms constructed from the concept of theory mind may be preferred under test time settings, explicitly test time settings, in comparison to directly attempting to learn a corporate team's representation distribution, which can drift in with readaption training. This mitigation is designed not to interfere with other defenses like the AB. So think of them like a layer defense, right? This is just another layer. We want to minimize the interference with another defense, and we want to minimize the amount of training or any sort of uh, fine tuning that has to be done for this defense because. While you have to retrain the VAV, you don't want to go train another layer of another defense because that would be expensive. So that you want them to be able to coexist and avoid excessive training. For future work, theory of mind is a big construct. There are many applications, but um, some of the things that we'll be talking about for future work are the limitations to theory of mind, like the limitations to recursive reasoning. You know, there are costs associated with theory of mind to actually recurse. Like as human beings, like we have theory of mind and it benefits us. But for simpler organisms, they may not have necessarily a theory of mind because it's just not beneficial cost efficiently for them. Um, there are exist strategic scenarios which can evade these defenses, right? Because this is a mitigation technique. But how easily are they reached during training? So the one thing that we didn't really do is we trained with this defense to see if any emergent other adversarial behaviors emerged. Um, and then if theory of mind is used in traditional settings, right? Does it actually suffer from the distribution drift, um, that occurs during additional training? Like is theory of mind, at least in these settings, right? Um, is it using a stationary distribution which is preserved across all iterations of training? That's something to be asked. And these are the references. And that's it. Thank you. Um, very well done. And further questions, I want to uh, I'm going to start the Q&A with a quick question about the update algorithm. Can you please watch that slide? This one, right? If you were to utilize as the new guy, how do you believe it was the performance? So, so as you imagine, right, if you for an inconsistent agent that becomes really inconsistent, it decreases over time. So a lot of false positives in the beginning and then slowly decrease over time. So it kind of curves out. If you reversed it, right, you start at zero, you're going to have a uh, false negative for in terms of distrusting agents, but then it'll curve out to being trusting because of the behavior, because it'll slowly drift off for um, consistent agents. And then the agents that are, quote, not trusted, right, would relatively stay low belief. How do you know that it curves out? In other words, how do you know that it's conversion? So the reason I say curves out is because um, when it comes to a belief, right, the belief itself is just going to be, uh, in terms of updating, right, it increases or decreases. And it's set to basically estimate the distribution of consistency. That's it. It doesn't necessarily say anything about adversarial behaviors if it's um, containing all adversarial behaviors, but for that particular settings of just the way beliefs gets updated, right? The consistency that gets estimated is going to be like, at some point, right? Unless you have a very strategic method of um, of, of, a, of a mixture of consistency and inconsistent actions together, which may flip the belief of doing uh, to, um, what, what, uh, um, I struggle with some values. Um, generally speaking, right, if, inconsistent action is a good representation or indicator of at least non-corporative behavior, right? Then you'll have that smooth curve. So if I understand correctly, you're saying that we know if the self-interested agent is always self-interested and has stationary qualities, it's going to converge. This belief update, belief update over consistency with cooperative qualities. So um, when it comes to objectives, it really comes down to the assumption of what type of objectives they have, right? If you know their objectives in this settings with finite resources are going to be at some point in conflict with yours, you will see a diversion in action because they need to perform actions in their pursuit of interest. If we're in settings where we don't exactly know their objectives, right? That may not even be there. That means something we can consider because we won't be able to know whether or not their actions distribution, you know, is optimal for both us and them in terms of that, but their message distribution may not. Okay, well, 
Uh, same thing. Uh, so we start, let's say, at the halfway point, right? Consistent actions, hoping that they are cooperative, right, would increase. And then agents who are inconsistent would slowly decrease as well. So you may see a very similar, but maybe not as extreme uh, dips and curves. So instead of starting like extremely high and then curving out, you may have like a little bump or a little nodge. Is there any sense in so yeah yeah so this modeling of trust this defense was actually modeled after like a credit system and like a credit card system the way you would think about that right um you could very much say a person with no credit is very bad it's just as bad as bad credit and so in other words, you can believe that's like maybe close to 0, 0.0 or something like that. Um, and then over time, as you accrue, quote, consistent actions or actions which they say, hey, this is good credit, they bump up your credit score as you go. And if you make a really bad decision or something like that, you can manage it, maybe it'll decrease it at some magnitude. But if you do like little small, like maybe small charges, right, or something like that, um, maybe that doesn't impact your score as much versus, let's say, uh, you took a loan on a house versus maybe like a twenty-five dollar credit um, surcharge. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Thanks. I was wondering. So you have to find evidence to it. So I believe this is a low dimensional belief that you mentioned. What's the high dimensional belief? So let me move up. There's this over here. So. High dimensional belief tends to be looking like this. So in conditional probability is the probability of a whole trajectory given the past history of actions that we have taken or the action observation and hearing that we've taken. Um, that's very high dimensional, right? If you think about any chain probability, unless you decide to squash it down into uh, conditional, which is one step time step. But in terms of uh, complexity, right? The output of this particular trajectory can be extremely high dimensional because the observation space can be high. So, uh, in graph movement, right, I was wondering how did you create the graph, which is, I think, in the seminar. I understand you are sharing the mechanism between agents over there, right, using uh, yes. message using aggregation graph neural network. Okay, so it works like this. You as an encoder, you can encode the message vector, uh, uh, the message that's encoded using the local observation. All the agents' vectors are put together based on their location, right? And then they get added into a, a into a vector that's about maybe I don't know how long, but it's a vector of any size. And then each agent's input is contributed based on the location of where they're coming from. So that's how they kind of get input it together. They toss in a whole bunch of Z's and then outputs a com uh, an aggregated input for each agent based on the radius of location. Okay, so that look a reference to the graph or is it a reference to the other uh, location of the radius? So the radius is, is more or less determined by the agent's radius. So let's say if the radius was like three or something like that, right? An agent that's over here, his input wouldn't actually actually come in like into the oh, actual so you only agent. Agent. Oh, so radius is part of the agent. And you have behind that, right? And then, and then certain dimensions of the agra, um, aggregation graph neural network represent different radiuses as well. Yeah, I have mm -hmm. What was the question answer? Yeah, I was wondering, like, if you had taken like different agent position and then you were creating the graph out of it, but if they were taking a single, uh, single agent as its own, what is it, like central of the graph and taking the radius. Right. So what I know about the the settings that was done in is that um, you know when you um, multiply matrices by some power right to to decrease or increase some values on set in the graph right um, they use the radius as basically a factor of weighing messages further out so the further you are out the less input actually gets put it into your decision making and then the closer they are the more the higher magnitude of input is actually put into. Into your into decision making. So that mixes is basically how much area that they have covered, right? Uh, so yeah, so yeah, yeah the 
the observation for each agent is like maybe if I say three radius rate, it's a three by three nine grid. And it's literally just saying zero one for if it's already used or not. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the non-quartive agent just stands for any agent that wasn't trained under quartive settings. So here specifically, it's a self-interested agent because it has its own objective to pursue. Um, that's usually what we call when we say non-corporative. It just not, wasn't part of the initial corporative setting as training. And he kind of just int was introduced into the multi-agent settings and he was learning with other, age, uh, other agents at some other point. So you can imagine it like this. Like, so you, let's say you train a corporative team in settings, right? Then you take that policy and you distribute it into some other environment where they're just doing whatever they're doing. Then you introduce a self-interested agent or somebody introduces their own self-interested agent into that environment because it's a shared environment. And that agent learns in that environment with that fixed corporate policy. So it's very similar to the idea, like if you distribute, let's say a model today on the internet that do stock trading, right? And someone does a week from now distributes their own model and they used it also in putting using uh, training in the same environment as your agent, right? And it takes your agent's input as also input, right? It could learn quote adversarial behaviors to uh, lower the, the the performance of your agents to maximize it. The objective intention In this setting, it happens to be because they're using finite resources in space, but in general settings, they could have completely different objectives. Whether or not they collide or whether they conflict with each other in some sort of way is something left to be seen. Adversarial in the sense of zero sum? Adversarial generally refers to zero sum, yeah. And in this case, is it also zero sum? Yes, technically, yes. What is the objective? It's the same objective for the corporate team, but for itself. So it wants to maximize the space on this grid um, at the cost of obviously the performance of the corporate team space on the grid. Um, does the adversarial agent, does self-interested agents uh, learn to communicate uh, using that mechanism? So you mean for theory of mind or do you mean for the, for the, okay. So what happens is, is after you have the corporate evasion fix policy in the environment, we introduce another agent, right? And then we have another architectural policy for that agent, which got swapped out for, let's say one of the corporate agents. Everything else is frozen except for that one layer of that corporate of that self-interested agent, and it learns parameters based on the parameters of the rest of the uh, graph neural network. So they're very much the same except for the representation. any. Um, so I'm sorry, could you could you say that again just because that one was dropping Yeah, I was about to and find the short So you said that you have some about it. I think I got an idea of what you're saying. So the original defense tends to be just coordinating from one particular point of view, which is one, one corporate evasion for themselves, right? There's no communication with other corporate evasions to, to determine if the one particular agent is adversarial or not. It's just from one perspective in that alone, right? Um, but likewise, right? Um, so uh, certain defenses, including this one, right? Uh, it can be this, so this one can be designed where you don't actually have to input other agents' behaviors as like a distribution and they may maybe accept 90% of the distribution except for the top 10 anomaly distribution. 
um, you could set it deterministic and literally say it set nobody's input unless they match or consistent with mine. But when it comes to, let's say, um, if a particular agent, right, says, hey, this guy, this one other agent is really inconsistent, has a really strong belief, it's very possible to share among formative agents that you are over another percentage of belief to share belief saying, hey, this guy is really, quote, uh, non-consistent with his action. Is it true for you too? And if that's true, you could use that as an additional mechanism to basically uh, uh, black um, blackmail, blacklist or whitelist. I, what is it? I think it's like blacklist, like, um, what is it called? It's called like silently blacklisting the, uh, uh, the self-interested agent's messages from the rest of the corporate team. So that can be done. Um, but in terms of actual numbers of adversaries that can be added, um, that's more of a less a perimeter. The defense that we have right now has said it so that a certain percentage of stochasticity, uh, stochasticity can exist for these agents in case there's like an uncertainty parameter that was added for some reason or another um, for it. But if you make that deterministic, right, then you could completely avoid uh, distribution across, uh, you could completely avoid um, the concepts of um, having some uncertainty for other cooperative agents' actions, even though they don't exactly match yours. So, and all in all, it depends on the defense. This defense that we have right now does work on a consensus basis in terms of one individual agent's input for other agents. So like, if it's say like most of the other agents matched except for maybe one or two or like something like that, right? Then we say, oh, we'll, 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 we'll lower our trust for this one particular agent because he's not matching the behavior of other agents as well that we observe. Um, so that can be used, but likewise, um, if it's you're in if you're in extreme settings where even a low chance of accepting adversarial communication can lead to detrimental impact on performance, it may be better to have stricter rules about uh, what uncertainties of the environment you're allowing to to risk over uh, adversarial communication from other agents. I hope I answered that. I we don't know the threshold because that depends on the so depends on the defense. If you're using one which is about the extensity of other agents' at actions, if they match and then outlying, right, you could find a ratio, a ratio that would fit within that distribution. You can find a whole bunch of threshold ratios that would fit within that margin of uh, question. If you set it to be deterministic, right, then that might be an answer of no, because there won't be exist a threshold because the threshold is zero. Or, I mean, you could exist, but it's zero, but. That's a very logical answer. So there is a threshold. No, that one has been set as a parameter because of the, depending on the environment and the risk associated with the environment and the task at hand, right, you may have higher risk or lower risk for certain tasks. Very well, that was an excellent question, Thank you. Um, we've been drilling you for quite a while <laughs> after you give us the data or given us a different talk. Are there any other questions? Do you have any more comments on my <laughs> The Reddit thing, right? That was awesome. It is awesome. Thank you. 
to the rock node and things. But I can see that with some people that I think you'll have uh, more features of the units that I should have put into rock, right? And based on that, I put uh, the amount of elements that we need to come, it be increased the number of steps. It's a hunch uh, based on graphing you know, So you might want to like to make it graphing just uh, by adjusting more. I mean, the idea and concept of the graph neural network existed within the settings primarily for C, uh, con, um, centralized training, decentralized execution. That was the main reason and the idea that the pursuit of individual greedy local reward is the ultimatum for the team itself. That was the only reason that was brought up for graph neural networks. But you're right in the sense that um, there is more information that could be transmitted in the graph neural network than just the op local observation here. Um, that would be useful for defense as well. So, so the AGNN is the model that was set with the environment for the initial um, training setting, right? So that's primarily where that came from. Uh, TLM was implemented on top of it. So. And same thing with VAED. Other questions? Let me when I check one more thing. Okay. Um, so now so we only have one last question. It's probably fired up here. But if you go to the slide that you talk about the VAEB, you also mentioned a more recent paper that I wasn't actually aware of. Yeah. The A and E paper. Mm -hmm. Are they following a similar approach as in they are pre-training the model of what would happen and then yes. the time? Yes, that's so, why it wasn't brought up again because it primarily works again, like in you requires training of this model, a learned parameter representation, like latent representation for the model before it implements. And it also is very much susceptible to distribution of chip as well. With that, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. We look forward to hearing about your um, awesome work. And thank you everyone for attending. We have another seminar by Lincoln. That's the same as the same time as the mechanics. Oh, yeah. 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 oh, yeah. Okay, only for now. Very well. Once again, and have a great weekend. Did you stop the recording? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.